Hello and welcome. So if you remember, in our k-means introduction video, we talked about knowing the number of clusters to begin with. We said step one is to decide the number of clusters, and then we proceed. But how do we actually decide the number of clusters? A lot of times, this may be provided to you by the business itself. For example, they tell you that we want our customers to be segmented into five categories, and that is something we respect. But if they leave it to you, that you decide what's the appropriate number of clusters that we should be looking at, how are you going to answer that question? This is exactly what we intend to look at in this particular video. Let's get started. So we're introducing a concept known as within sum of squares. I'll explain this with the help of proper examples. Let's say we have some data. It's the same data that you have represented in three different grid blocks. Scenario one is when we say that we want to have just one cluster, which means we will just have one center and all these points will be called as the member of that one cluster. Scenario two is where we choose to have two clusters. The value of K is two. So we are saying that we'll form two clusters, something like this. These markers here represent the centroid. And scenario three is when let's say we choose to experiment with three clusters. So we have the first centroid, second centroid, and the third centroid. Now let's join each point to its respective centroid. So in case one, if we do that, we'll be seeing these kind of lines. So within sum of squares is nothing but these squared distances added up. You square each of these distances and you just sum them up. That will be called the within sum of squares for k is equal to one. If you do that, you realize that you're just forming one cluster. So this is the scenario when we have just one cluster. What will be the case when we have two clusters? Once again, we have to join every single point to its respective centroid. So the centroid for these three points is this one. The centroid for these four points is this one. You have to join all these together. Now we have to again add the squared distances. But if you see the length of these lines compared to the previous scenario has reduced significantly. Why? Because the centroid has come closer. Earlier the centroid was somewhere in the middle. Now the centroid is in a close proximity to these points, more in a local neighborhood. So obviously the distances have reduced. And if the distances have reduced, the squared distances, when you'll sum them up, would also be a smaller value. So you form two clusters. And what would happen if we further look at an increase in the number of clusters? For example, we choose to go with three clusters. So maybe the first scenario would be one and the same because this is as such a cluster which is far from the rest of the points. But maybe in this local neighborhood, you'll be able to find out a different centroid for these two points and a different centroid for these two points. And this is how you form your three clusters. What has happened? If you see the length of these lines here was relatively larger when you had just one centroid for these four points. Since you further broke it into two centroids, the length of this line has reduced. The distances have reduced. If the distances have reduced, the squared distances, when you add them up, would also be a smaller value. So in general, we can say if we increase the number of clusters, the within sum of a squares value is going to reduce. Now comes a question. What will be the within sum of a squares value when every point is treated as a cluster? In our case, we have these seven points. So if we say that every single point is a cluster in itself, the moment we say that, we realize that we are saying the centroid lies at the center of this point itself. So centroid and the center of the point are all coinciding. You're not going to take a centroid elsewhere because the point itself is being treated as a cluster. And if that is the case, then all these distances have reduced to zero, which we earlier saw as lines would not have any length any further. And therefore, if you treat every single point as a cluster, then the within sum of a squares value will reduce to zero. You would really encounter this because we don't work with six or seven points when we're doing clustering. This is more for illustration purposes that we've taken it like this. So let's see if we start plotting the within sum of a squares value for different values of k, what would that look like? So here's a plot called a WSS plot where on the x-axis we have the number of clusters and on the y-axis we have the within sum of a squares. Another name for within sum of a squares is inertia. So we get the points like this. For example, initially the within sum of a squares value is much greater. It reduces as we increase the number of clusters, further reduces, and beyond a point you will see that the decline is not that steep. It's becoming more and more flat. Let's say we join these with the help of different lines connecting these points. Coming back to the question that we started with, how do we decide the number of clusters? So the number of clusters in such plots are typically decided by the point, which resembles an elbow. That's why we often call it an elbow plot as well. See, 
up till this point where we have the number of clusters as three, you can imagine the decline has been relatively steep. But beyond this point, it's becoming more and more flat. So the point up to which you were seeing a steep decline would be the number of clusters that you will increase. Once again, this is just a quantitative way to determine it. If you are assisting a business and your client already has a preference that they want to have five clusters, you wouldn't mind doing five clusters. It's in those cases when they leave the decision to you that you need to determine the right number of clusters is when you have to follow this practice. But there could be another twist here. What if there is no elbow? That's also a possibility. Let's see. So this is a different WSS plot where it's almost looking like a line with some changes here and there. So you can't claim in this case that up to a point, the decline was steep and beyond that point, it is not so steep because it's looking one and the same to us. This can very much happen in a real world data. So what to do in those cases when we don't have an elbow? Is there another way that we can find out the right number of clusters? So let's say to begin with, we have made a choice that we want to have three clusters. Each of these clusters have a center point, which is represented by C1, C2, and C3. Now let's take a point belonging to cluster one. So this is a point that belongs to cluster one. It is supposed to be more similar to the observations within cluster one, and it's supposed to be significantly different from the observations belonging to the other clusters. That's the property of a good clustering. Let's join this point to the center of the cluster to which it belongs. And let's then join this point to the nearest cluster center. So of these two choices, C2 and C3, which is the nearest one? I assume you can figure out C2 looks like a shorter distance. If we join this by a line, this looks like a shorter distance compared to the distance between this point and C3. So let's join this. Now we have some labels for these. So the distance between the point and its own cluster center to which it currently has been assigned is something that we call as A. And the distance between the point and the other cluster center is something that we are calling as B. Now we're going to calculate something that's known as the silhouette width. So what is a silhouette width that's calculated with the help of a formula like this? So it's the difference between B minus A. B and A are both these distances divided by the max of A and B. Now you can imagine this will be a positive value if B is greater than A, which makes sense because we are saying this point is closer to the center of the cluster to which it has been assigned, to which it currently belongs. And that's how it should be. You should be closer to your own cluster center. And it is farther from the cluster center to which this point does not belong makes complete sense. So this is a positive value when the assignment of this point is appropriate. It's assigned to the right cluster. We're saying this is supposed to be a positive value because B is greater than A. And the denominator in this case is just, and the denominator here is just the maximum of the two distances. And these distances cannot be negative. So denominator will always be positive. Numerator will be positive subject to B being greater than A. But this value will be a negative value if somehow a is greater than B, which simply means that we've assigned the point to a wrong cluster because it is closer to another cluster center compared to its own current assignment. So Silbert score is a value that will typically be between minus one to one, both inclusive. The extreme case where it becomes one will be a scenario when the point is sitting right at its center. So in that case, you can imagine in this formula, this value of A will become zero if the point is right in the center, the distance reduces to zero. So this A is zero, so you're saying B divided by max of zero and B, which will again be B, so B divided by B, that will be one. When would that be minus one? When this distance from B is zero, which means this point is sitting at the center of the other cluster. So this distance B has become zero. Now if you look at this distance, it will be zero minus A, which is negative A, divided by A comma zero, which is going to be A, A is a finite value. So minus A divided by A, that will be minus one. That's how you'll get it. Those are extreme cases. Now, if you've understood this much, what we've done for just one point is something that we may have to do for all the points present in our data. So when we calculate the silhouette widths of all the points and take an average of it, that's known as the silhouette score. Again, a value between minus one to one. The positive values are preferred because they represent the point has been assigned to the right cluster. The negative values, raise a question on the quality of clustering. Among the positive values, the higher the value, the better it is. Don't worry if some of these concepts are still taking time for you to digest. 
when we do the hands-on piece, this will begin to settle pretty well. So we'll demonstrate all these pieces that we've covered theoretically through a hands-on example. So far, we have prepared the data and we've performed k-means clustering. One thing that I want to call out before we even begin this, this is a quantitative approach. This may suggest certain number of clustering, but that's not something which is cast in stone. What I mean to say is that in practice, a lot of times the business that you're supporting would tell you the number of clusters they want. They would say that we want our customers to be segmented into five to seven groups. That's something which will take priority over what I determined here. But if this decision is left to you, that you determine the right number of clusters, then you can apply these techniques that I'm going to talk about. So we've already theoretically explained to you the WSS method. We are instantiating a dictionary here with these two curly brackets. It's a dictionary in PyCon, which is empty right now. Dictionary is a data structure which has key value pair. Right now, an empty dictionary called WSS is being initiated. We are going to go over a range of cluster possibilities starting from one to 10. When I write range one to 11, it means one to 10. So we are going to go over a range of possible clusters wherein to the k-means, we'll fit different number of clusters. We have mentioned a random state for the same purpose that stated in the earlier video. And we are fitting the scaled data, which is the treated data. Now, when we do this, this has an attribute called inertia, which is nothing but the within sum of squares. So we are saying, keep on updating this dictionary called WSS with the key value as the number of clusters and the value as the inertia. Then we are plotting this with the keys, as in the number of clusters on the x-axis and the values of the inertia on the y-axis. We're giving proper titles and labels to the axes. Let's just run this and see how the output. So this should come up with something like an elbow plot. Well, it's not a very encouraging elbow here, if you see. And we discussed this as a possibility in our theory video that there may be times when you don't get a very clear elbow. You'll be lucky to get a good elbow, and you can then say that, okay, this is the number of clusters we want. But here, somewhere here, you see two clusters, and thereafter, it's kind of uniform decline. Not exactly a straight line, but it's not very different as well. So the point is, it could be that we settle for three clusters. It could be that we settle for four, maybe five. Generally, we prefer odd number of clusters. There's no mandate though, but you know we can check for all the possibility. So how do we break this? We'll now have to rely on the Silvit score. And how do we compute it? So we'll have to call it first of all from the scikit-learn metrics, Silvit score, and this needs to input. This needs the treated data, and this needs the labels. So let's just run this. It'll give us an output. You can see the output is 0 0.106. Generally, the positive values are considered good and the greater the value, the better the clustering is. Negative values here would mean that there are a lot of observations which have been assigned to the wrong clusters. Positive values indicate the clusters have been rightly identified. But we don't know if we can get better clustering if I increase the number of clusters. So let's experiment with that. We only check for three. Why don't we try for five in this case? Let's change the number of clusters to five and a different random state. You can change it or keep it the same and just do a fit predict exact same steps as we did earlier. This gives an output that we can print. This is 0.102. So this is not better compared to the previous one. And of course, we are increasing the number of clusters here. So in this case, the better choice would be three clusters only. What we originally started with is kind of confirmed here that we can do three clusters. That seems to be a better outcome. Remember, for comparable output, always choose the simpler approach. Why would you want to create five clusters when three clusters are sufficient for you to work on. So that is it about deciding the number of clusters using two approaches, the elbow method and the silhouette score. Hope you had something meaningful to learn from this video. Thank you.